So what should what what sort of Dharma talk should we have? Right livelihood. Right livelihood. Well, you know that that's, that's a really that's a good one. I like that one. You know, in terms of in in terms of uh, the standard formula, right livelihood is not making your living in ways that uh, are harmful to other people. So, and, and actually, if you if you look to see what that meant 2,500 years ago, it meant not dealing in arms or being a butcher or being a slave trader. I guess that was <laughs> a common thing back then. But I think, you know, I think the idea of right livelihood, uh, there's a lot in that that we can, can take to heart and make use of as lay practitioners, I mean, for, uh, for, uh, for a Buddhist monk, uh, livelihood's a pretty simple question. So where livelihood really, where the issue of right livelihood really takes on importance is for a lay person. And it's a complicated situation because everything is so interconnected <coughs> There are a lot of uh, a lot of occupations that uh, you know e even the ones that ostensibly are uh, intended to benefit other people uh, you can't always be sure that they're going to turn out that way. <laughs> Some of them are, are misguided. But what does it mean to a layperson? For one thing, it means that you're you're supporting yourself. You're taking care of yourself. You're not. Uh, you're not being a burden to anyone else. I think that's one thing that right livelihood means. Um, <coughs> and so in that regard, uh, if you're going to take care of yourself, then you have to balance the amount of time and energy that goes into supporting yourself and the effects that you're activities have on, on other people. And I think that uh, the way to regard right livelihood is uh, not, not limiting it to whether you're an arms dealer or a butcher or something, but doing something, trying as much as possible to do something that is supportive of your spiritual practice as a whole. So that would mean doing something that uh, that helps people in some way, that provides some very real benefit for other people. That even though you're making your living from it, allows you to practice acting out of loving kindness and compassion, rather than just doing things because it's your job to do them. So, uh, you know, and there's a lot of Dharma practitioners going to professions like nursing and uh, social work and things like that for exactly that reason, so that they can feel like the time they spend uh, earning their living is also time that's uh, spent doing things that are beneficial to other people. And I think that is, I think that's a really good approach. It's a really good attitude. If you're already in a profession and you have to evaluate it, or a profession, career, job, you've already you've already got a job that you're doing to make a living, and you have to evaluate it in terms of right livelihood, that can be a very interesting situation to be in too. You might look at your at your employment and see that to some degree it, it involves. Uh, exploitation of other people, or to some degree it involves some uh, dealing in unfair ways. I really wonder, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the financial industries in this country and things like that, 
could anybody be a sincerely practicing Buddhist and work in some of these uh, financial industries and look at what they're doing and, and, and believe that they're practicing right livelihood. And I think if somebody, if somebody was a Buddhist and that's the business that they were in, they'd really need to look at that very closely and either do something else or try to figure out a way to turn around what they're doing. But that's be a pretty difficult thing to turn around. What but about what about all those people like I'm a retired academic and mm -hmm. some of my retirement money goes into like funds it went into like um, TIAGRF and stuff like that and so those investments are made by by the people who manage those mm -hmm. funds and I have no idea if any of those investments are in like arms or mm -hmm. harmful things I don't know you know it's not because I couldn't find out. Right. You know, I could find out, but it's I haven't done so. But I think about it, you know, and I think about, well, even in ways that you don't even, that don't compute, you know, you say you put your mm -hmm. money in the money market or something, and it, it's going, you, you hope to help people, but that might not be the case at all. So. You're absolutely right. That's a very good point. So... You know, you receive you receive ret retirement income, and you have no idea what it's invested in. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, you could probably drive yourself crazy. You know, okay, the the retirement funds invested in these mutual funds, and these mutual funds are invested in what other securities, what other kinds of stocks, and what do those companies do? You'd spend an awful lot of time, and you know what, the nature of things in the world the way they are, I'm almost certain that you find that that money was invested in things that you'd rather it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> and then you put yourself in a situation of, well, well, what do I do then? Do I say, I don't want my pension anymore? I send it back? <laughs> or you start writing letters to the pension fund manager saying that, you know, uh, get out of the slave trade. Yeah, get out, <laughs> yeah, take, take the money out of the slave trade. And, and a ballistics missile factory, and uh, <laughs> well, now I don't think that that is a, is a very useful and productive way to go. And I'm just guessing, of course, but I think the Buddha would agree with me. One of the practices that the Buddha tried out, that he followed before that, before his own enlightenment, uh, he uh, he was for a while a practitioner of the Jain religion. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with that. It's, it's still exists today. It's been around a long, long time. But one of their most fundamental beliefs is that that anything you do causes harm to something somewhere. Uh, modern Jains wear face masks so that they won't accidentally inhale a tiny insect. And uh, they're, they're very, very careful where they step. And they go to these enormous extreme measures in everything they do. And the Jain ideal is that since anything you do causes harm to other beings, that you do as little as possible. As a matter of fact, the, the true ideal, the ultimate goal of a Jain would be to starve to death. That's an extreme. And that's the kind of extreme that the Buddha uh, warned people against. And... You know, it, it, it is absolutely true that uh, you, you can't... It, it's the nature of life on this earth uh, that life lives on life. And, you know, it, it may be that the, the plants are more or less innocent, but everything else is living at the expense of something else. 
And of course, as the Jains were aware, you know, if you drink water, you don't know what you might have, what organisms were in it. At each step you take, you might crush something. And each breath you take, you might uh, uh, destroy something. So that you just drive yourself crazy if you try to avoid any of that. But there is a big difference between that and doing something for your own benefit, fully aware that the action you're taking is uh, a cause of harm to others. And in connection with this, I, I think of uh, the Buddha's uh, uh, instructions with regard to eating meat. He told his bhikkhus and also the lay followers, but first of all, he told the bhikkhus, you know, when you go on your alms round, if you're given meat, then you uh, gratefully accept it. The only time they were not allowed to eat meat is if an animal, if, if they they weren't to kill an animal themselves, and of course that would be a violation of the precept. And they also weren't to eat meat that had been killed for them. And, um, you know, so... Now, of course, you, you look at that and you say, okay, but if I buy meat in the grocery store, then every pound of meat I buy, somebody is going to uh, you know, raise another steer or a pig or a chicken or whatever to, to replace it as long as it keeps being consumed. So, but we can look at that and we can kind of see, okay, the Buddha is right. On, on the one hand, if you... If, if, if you go too far to one extreme, it gets ridiculous. Because then you wouldn't able, be able to eat wheat or soybeans or corn, uh, or most vegetables for that matter. And as a matter of fact, the total, uh, the total number of lives that are lost in uh, producing a meal from, uh, from vegetables is quite high. There's all kinds of animals uh, not just insects, but also uh, small mammals that uh, are destroyed in the process of, of producing crops. And uh, so you can go too far. But on, on the other hand, obviously, you know, killing or having something killed for you is going too far the other way. And then there's that ground in between, the, the middle ground, the middle way, which, okay... You might, in walking the middle way, you might decide not to eat meat. Or you might decide to, as long as it's not, you know, uh, well, you could, you could add some scruples in there and say that you won't eat chicken and pork that have been ra raised in inhumane conditions. And maybe you would only eat meat from organically raised and... Uh, healthy, happy animals. You know, these are, these are kinds of things that there's not any answer to, to what's right for, it, uh, for everybody. And uh, when it comes to something like the issue of your livelihood, well, exactly the same argument might apply. Suppose you work for a grocery store chain. The grocery store chain sells meat products, including those that from animals that have been uh, terribly abused and, and uh, exploited. Uh, so, does that mean that working in a grocery store is no longer a right livelihood? You have to balance it out, I think, and you have to find what feels right in your own heart. Um, in a sense, it's good to keep in mind that in the following of precepts and in the following of your conscience, both, what's most important is what's happening in your own mind. So, if you're aware of definite harm that's coming from an action, 
And if you are deliberately ignoring that because uh, of the benefit to you, then obviously you're making bad karma for yourself. Right? If you, on the other hand, you know, if it's not in, if, if that concern is not in your mind stream, and what you are instead concerned with is, you know, for example, you're, you're doing a job and you're, you haven't really thought about what other negative consequences it might have. But you're doing this job because um, it, uh, it allows you to carry out the rest of your spiritual practice. It, it, it makes you enough of a living without being greedy and excessive. Uh, it doesn't uh, leave you exhausted and stressed out so that it's difficult for you to do your practice afterwards. If it gives you an opportunity to meet and help other people and you know pass on some degree of goodwill and happiness and assistance in the world, you know if you're doing your job and that's how you're seeing it, you're seeing it in terms of all the positives that come in terms of promoting your spiritual practice, allowing you to practice loving kindness, uh, open-heartedness, generosity in your interactions with other people, then it's obviously going to fall into the good karma category, right? But um, it still could be that if you look closely enough that, you know, that there, was, there would be some harm coming. As a matter of fact, I think there's probably very, very few things that you could do that, if you looked into them far enough, aren't causing harm. I mean, I think the Jains were right. To be alive means that you're causing some harm to something, somewhere. Mm -hmm. But the point is, if that's not your intention, and if you're not in this place of being willing to do that in spite of being aware of it, for the sake of your own desire, then you know I, th I think that's that's the middle road that you've got to walk. But I think what makes the idea of right livelihood most interesting to me, at least in terms of what I've been thinking of lately, is that right livelihood is what supports you in your spiritual practice, and it. And what you do in, in your livelihood, if it allows you to practice while you're doing it, if it's a job that you can do mindfully, if all of your interactions with other people can be done not only mindfully, but coming from a wholesome place of, of loving kindness and generosity, that's that's really right livelihood, and that's think, I think that's where it becomes really important. A lot of people think, young people are concerned, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Well, I want to do something that's really satisfying. But even if they think of noble activities as satisfying, I want to be a, a, a noble do-gooder. But why? They want to be a noble do-gooder so that they feel good about themselves, then that's not that's not really quite the same thing as I want to do the same thing for the sake of the benefit that it brings to other people. And so I think real uh, right livelihood is where granted as a lay person you need to make your own living. If you can say everything else beyond the fact that I have to do some kind of work and receive some kind of pay to live, if then everything else becomes based on the criteria of uh, of how does this contribute to uh, leading a spiritual life and following a spiritual path and carrying out your spiritual practices, then that's right livelihood. And then you can become a nurse for the sake of helping people, and not only that, it pays your bills as well. Mm -hmm. you know? Or you can do whatever it is that you do. 
people that the age of uh, uh, that we are usually already settled in. We're not at that stage of mm-hmm. trying to figure out what we're going to do with our life. Although it quite often happens unexpectedly. But all <laughs> <Hello>. yeah. <laughs> Chopped liver over here. <laughs> so. But you know, uh, uh, since not everyone is in Judy's situation, (laughs) although keep in mind that any one of you could suddenly find yourself in that what what am I going to do when I grow up situation, (laughs) when when you suddenly discover that what you were doing is not going to continue. But anyway, I'm assuming. Well, that. I know that if some people, some of you are retired, some of you are still working, and and you, you're probably not going to completely change your your career path right now. I mean, you're totally engrossed in it; you can't get loose from it. I don't know what you do, Bob. It's probably the same thing, though. It's like <laughs> it might that it would be, but at the so then, right livelihood is more in terms of working with what you've already got. You know. It's sort of saying, okay, here's here here's where I am. Where can I go from here? And maybe it's not artist. really that different. <laughs> What's that? I said he was an arms merchant. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at one point in my life, <laughs> at one point in my life, I was a newly minted PhD. I had all kinds of wonderful offers to at very to work in very prestigious universities and prestigious labs with uh, with well-known people, and it was the thing that when I when I a few years earlier as a graduate student it was it was precisely the kind of goal that I hoped that uh, that I would be able to achieve, but. In the meantime, I had become a Buddhist and started practicing Buddhism. And here I was doing laboratory research that involved the wholesale slaughter of large numbers of, of small animals, uh, mainly rats, ferrets, and cats. And you know, there was just there was, there was no way I had. I had the, the, the two best offers I had. One was University of California at San Diego, and the other was uh, the University uh, in Rio de Janeiro. And, and I really liked the idea of maybe going and living in Brazil and you know, seeing what that was like for a while, do a postdoc <laughs> there. But I, and instead, I, I, I quit and did start all over. I ended up, I took a year off and lived in the mountains uh, looking after youth hostels uh, for a year. And then I went and uh, uh, opened a bookstore and ran a bookstore for a while, a spiritual bookstore. You know. But then finally I went back into academia and said, okay, I'll teach, but I won't do research. <laughs> but sometimes you have to make those kinds of decisions. But it's uh, the same thing, you know. You can go overboard too. Mm-hmm. You can go overboard. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about the right livelihood aspect of collecting your pension. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, since it's come into your mind, it seems to me like it might be a most reasonable thing to at least see. If there is anything that you can do to create an influence, and I know this has happened other places, I don't know about in the United States, but in Canada, you know, uh, people uh, get together and they demand that things like pension funds or mutual funds and things like that that they invest in, they go to, uh, they say, look, you know, we want this to go into. Uh, these kinds of investments and not those, or green investments. Or, so I don't know if such a thing, a possibility exists, but since you thought of it, you might as well find yeah, out. Yeah, it's kind of been planned. It's, it's, 
its way in my mind. And then in a Buddhist magazine, Buddha Dharma or something like that, they, um, they had an advertisement for some particular fund. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is bound to be a Buddhist fund. So I called up. And I talked to the people, and they said, well, you have to start with a million dollars. And I just thought, well, that no. <laughs> <laughs> that took care of the rest of the conversation, <laughs> didn't it? But they do have funds. Mm -hmm. They do have funds that you know, invest in certain things. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. You know, and, and whether or not <coughs> the people that run your pension fund would care or not, Still, if you wrote a letter uh, or, or did whatever is available to mm -hmm. be done, mm -hmm. you never can tell. That's right. you know, might make a difference. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I, 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 like the, I, I like the thought of right livelihood as, you know, it's, I, I think if you're a lay person in the world, right livelihood should be, you know, boy, that should be the main thing that you're thinking about because that's what sets well, that together with uh, marriage, I guess, uh, or, or at least sex, is what sets a, a, a lay person apart from a monastic anyway. And since livelihood is, is the most important distinction between you and a nun somewhere, then uh, that should be right in, the, right in the forefront of your thought. It's good to do things like serving people, helping people to be happy, helping people to overcome their problems, uh, helping people to heal, um, and uh, of course helping people to meditate and learn the Dharma and practice mm -hmm. it. So. That's right, livelihood. That's right, livelihood. <laughs> Ah, that's what I think about. Yeah. Anything else that uh, is on your minds? I went uh, over the allocated talking period. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I didn't. I must have just had the timer set wrong. So yes, we've got we've got time to, to talk about more things. We you know and, and then go over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a, a bit of a different direction, mm -hmm. but um, my thought was triggered by your mention of the Janes, mm -hmm. and I'm not at all sure how to ask this in a sense, but, you know, if you were a bird looking down <laughs> on the world, yeah. on, on human affairs, there okay. seems to be, in no matter what area of, in, of human endeavor that you look at, there are extremes. Yes. Way, way out. Mm -hmm. And... Look, look, you know, if this bird looking down on human affairs did so with great impartiality, um, I find it so curious that there are such extremes in a sense. Um, that, that energy within the human heart and spirit runs to such extremes. Now, here's where I, I don't quite know how to formulate the question, but it, it seems to be a very curious thing. I mean, because extremes make life very, uh, uh, create great suffering mm -hmm. so oftentimes. Um, people caught in the middle of extremes, um, the, the earth, plants and animals caught between extreme endeavors. Is, is there, uh, what, what, why, why is that in the universe? I mean, why, 
Why are there such extremes? Well, are, are you asking about extremes in human society or extremes in the universe? <laughs> Well, I started out by this whole thing by saying it was a question, but but extre because extremes cause suffering mm -hmm. um, so often, it, it seems unreasonable that in human affairs there would there would be extremes. I mean, we have not self-regulated ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, is there? It, does does Buddhism have anything to say about such things? And you know, in, in, in the realm of suffering and why suffering occurs. And yes, and, and it's the same things that you've already heard before. The all of these extremes can be traced to to craving, to desire and aversion. If you think about it. The, it seems to me that humanity as a whole, that humans as a species, are out of balance. And how they came to be out of balance, um, this happens in the universe. Mm -hmm. The universe is made up of extremely complex uh, constantly interacting uh, dynamic systems. And so over time, every now and then something happens and a system gets really out of balance. And the system as a whole goes to such extremes that then there's some dramatic shift, which brings it back into some new kind of equilibrium. And I think that's been happening with human beings, however it came to be, you know, that we have the capacities that we do, the intellect that we have and the ability to use tools, our hands, and our ability to speak and communicate and act collectively, it's so far beyond uh, the capabilities of any other organism on this planet. And none of these things are bad things. Our intellect is not a bad thing. Our ability to use tools is not a bad thing. Speech and ability to communicate is not a bad thing. But it has put us totally out of equilibrium with the rest of the planet. And so, I mean, the, the planet is covered with people, literally. It's, you know, it's absurd how many people there are on this planet. And that's because... In spite, in spite of the brains and the hands and the speech that we have, which makes us the most incredibly successful competitor and more capable of taking care of ourselves and assuring the continuation of our species, we are still compelled by exactly the same mechanisms that function in the in the simplest of, of organisms, mm -hmm. in, in in deers and deer and wolves and squirrels and and mice and uh, lizards and birds and everything else. Uh, the the sexual compulsion. I mean, one reason that we exist in such numbers is the sexual compulsion that we. And we, we have the same compulsion rooted in desire for sensual pleasures and uh, for having the things that we uh, need for our survival. And we have the same compulsion to avoid those things that are dangerous to us and cause us suffering as all of these simpler organisms. But we have the capacity to act out of those and produce a, a, an absurdly out of balance situation. And that's what we've done. That's the extreme that we have. There's way too many of us. But it's not only that there's way too many of us, those that there are of us feel like we have to have so much more than we really have to have. And we're willing 
in order to have it, to do it at the cost of the planet, at the cost of other species, and at the cost of each other. There's nothing restraining us, you know. The most brilliant minds on the planet are actually devoted to how to take money away from other people and things like that, you know. And there, those those minds are attached to bodies whose names are on bank accounts worth billions, and they still don't have enough. And it trickles all the way down to the person who already has more than they need and gets in debt because they think they need even more, you know. So, so we, we, we're covering the surface of the planet with people and we're destroying things right and left in order to have things. And then there's the other side. Anytime we feel threatened, you know, we, we get riled up and we're ready to, to uh, destroy whatever it is that we see is threatening to us. You know, whether we want to make war against another nation or uh, destroy other animals because they're going to uh, eat the flowers in our garden you know, or you know, all these, uh, all these different urges to destroy because they threaten what we have or what we want, what we think we need. So, how we came to be so out of balance in the first place, you know, maybe someday somebody will figure it out. It's really an interesting puzzle, but but we, nothing like us has ever happened in the history of the planet as it's been traced up to this time. We're something unique, and the consequences we're having are really, really bizarre. But now here's the interesting part, and this is where the Buddha's teaching comes in. And you know, this is this is how I would sum up the Buddha's the, the impact of Buddhism on society and ethics. Ethics, other than the role they play in helping a person to become awakened of ethics is that that we can't continue uh, with the brains we have and with the other capabilities that we have and with the collective power that we have, we can't continue to be uh, driven entirely by desire and aversion, by craving. And essentially the message was that we don't need to be and not only do we not need to be, but it is possible that we can cease to be. How do we cease to be? As you know, we've talked a lot about the individual level, but what I wonder about is, is as, as a uh, as a species, <laughs> how does humanity? change its values, because the values of humanity are firmly rooted in greed and hatred. There's absolutely no question. And delusion. And delusion. That's all, yes, right. And delusion. But there is no society on this planet that can honestly claim not to foster and encourage greed in its members and to reward greed. Even though we, we have structures to try to limit the impact of greed and even though we pay lip service to the idea, you know, in fact, all the societies do promote greed and they also promote hatred. It's as simple as that. So how do we, how do we change the human race so that we no longer hold greed and hatred up as the ideals, and maybe we hold up uh, non-greed and love and compassion as the ideals. So even those people that aren't already awakened, that aren't already Buddhas, that haven't already overcome craving, we're born with craving, but, that, but it seems to me if our society didn't nurture that from the from the, uh, the age, as soon as we're able to communicate with other beings and we watch TV and we go to school and everything else, then, you know, the desire and aversion that we're born with is 
is fed and encouraged and caused to be out of control? What if we had a different effect? What if we had a society whose values were the opposite of that? And so that from a very young age, a person learned that uh, although they experienced desire and aversion, that these are things to be uh, to, to learn to practice restraint over. That might make a difference. I'm not sure, though. But, you know, all we can do is try, see what happens. You know, we don't need all the things that we have, especially in this society. The Whatever it is, six billion people on this planet could, with what we already have, uh, live very, very comfortably in smaller quarters. And Everyone, with no exception, eat very well with the amount of food that's available. And if we put the resources and energy that we waste so extravagantly into things like health care, we could have six billion people living a simpler life, uh, being healthy, well-fed, and probably being a lot happier because they wouldn't have, uh, on the one hand, those uh, People wouldn't have the stress of poverty, and on the other hand, all these other people wouldn't have the stress of trying to always get more and hold on to what they have to and worry about what's going to happen if they lose it. So it'd be a lot less stress. But that kind of utopian idea, you know, as soon as I imagine it, the first thing I think of is, oh yeah, and then there would be 12 billion, and what then? You know, so. <laughs> So I don't know, but I do I do really clearly see that if you were the bird flying over the planet and you see all these excesses down below you, that you could trace all of those excesses very, very simply to the, the same desire and aversion and delusion that we've been talking about all along. And that the reason that you see these excesses is because the desire and aversion and the delusion happen to be coupled with this incredibly, with these, with this really incredibly powerful mind and speech and and uh, tool using capability that we have. Because lizards are filled with delusion, desire, and aversion too, but they don't create near as much problem. <laughs> I think that what we need to work for is our own personal spiritual evolution and that we cannot do that separately from society as a whole. We are not separate from each other. We absolutely are not. Um, and so our own personal spiritual evolution will be a significant con contribution to the spiritual evolution of mankind as a whole. And it might sound a little bit like Maharishi Mahesh in this, mm -hmm. but if enough people could become awakened to the extent of being free of craving, and it wouldn't have to be such a huge number, but if, en if enough people could, I think the impact that would flow out from them could change our society's values and could we could maybe come to the place where human beings continue to evolve but not no longer biologically but now spiritually we take the incredible gifts of biological evolution and apply them in a different way and we free ourselves from the really crude just so utterly crude driving mechanism that uh, uh, that has got us this far. I mean, it's it really it's desire and aversion uh, that over two billion years of evolution has resulted in there being a species as successful as we are. But it's time to let it go. You know, now that we're here, it's time to let it go. We have to go beyond it. And if we don't, well. Then the bird later on will be flying over and say, well, nothing left. <laughs> because that's what happens when systems go to extremes, is they collapse. And then, of course, new systems arise and, 
a new equilibrium is established. But we're way, way, way out of balance. Does that help you any? <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's all all right stuff. Um, is there is there such a because this this sort of was at the root of it, and I didn't express it before. Is there such a thing as archetypes, uh, be, as it might relate to extremes? As it might relate to it. To extremes. Archetypes. Are arch are, are archetypes strictly a a, a, a human? Development, or, or are there archetypes that that exist in the abstractosphere, so to speak, <laughs> to to which human beings sort of stream stream into? I, that was sort of at the root of my question. Mm -hmm. I didn't express it. Well, that's actually a kind of philosophical question that's been around pretty much as long as there's been a written history of human beings. The, and, you know, this isn't the place to go into it, but just to point out to you that uh, Plato's idealism, or really Socratic idealism, because Socrates was, was the teacher that is really positing that ultimately reality is a world of archetypes. And, and so there's, since that time, there's been many different philosophical approaches to trying to sort that kind of question out. And what the Buddha had to say about things like that is that all of these are views, and all of these views are ultimately wrong. But on the other hand, views can be helpful to us. So we could take some of these ideas and apply them in a way that perhaps is useful as long as we don't uh, as, lo as long as we don't allow ourselves to get too caught up in our views. And, and so yes. Have you heard the story um, about do people go into a hotel room or a motel room, there's a nice big bed and then a little bed in the corner. The big bed's by the window. And two people go in and one person goes, oh, I really like that big bed. And, um, and then another two people go in and one of those people says, oh, I don't like that little bed. That's awful. And then another two people go in and one person says, well, I'll take the big bed. And the other one says, fine, you know, I'll take the little bed. Anyway, <laughs> in Buddhist psychology, there are three types, right? The one that goes, oh, I really like the big bed. That's the greedy type. Mm -hmm. And the one that goes, oh, I don't like that little bed. That's the aversive type. Mm -hmm. And the one that it doesn't matter is the deluded type. And the moral of the story is it's always better to travel with a deluded person. <laughs> 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 That's a good story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they do kind of sometimes, you know, categorize and make yeah. archetypes right. out of how people are. Everyone, of course, is probably a mixture, mm -hmm. but most of us have one or the other characteristic. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, side, like of the greedy type, is they tend to be extremely generous, and the uh, aversive type tend to be very wise, and you know, the deluded type tend to have the other side of being very, you know, once they get over their delusion, very wise. And the aversive type is compassionate, has a lot of compassion. When they That's get the over being, yeah. yeah. So they're, yeah. you know, the negative and the positive yeah. sides. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we're all, we're all all three though, yeah. and. Uh, yeah. Not only that, but the, the, the desire and the aversion are uh, always com com there aren't really three types. There's the there's the greedy deluded, there's the aversive deluded, and there's the deluded deluded. <laughs> yeah, because all all of the desire and aversion always occur together with uh, delusion. 
but archetypes they're ideas that we create in our mind mm -hmm. and they're useful they help they help our mind to um, make sense of things and they have their own reality so I like the archetype of the hero So, did somebody invent the archetype of the hero? Or is the archetype of the hero an inevitable consequence of there existing such a thing as a human mind? What do you think? I think Joseph Campbell invented the archetype of the hero. Do you think Joseph Campbell invented it? <laughs> or, or maybe it was Ulysses. I mean, maybe, maybe it was uh, whoever wrote Ulysses, I forget. Yeah. One of those Greeks. But <laughs> don't you think if... if uh, if somebody hadn't written Ulysses, that somebody else would have. Yeah, so. I do. Yeah. Well, there are I mean, maybe Shakespeare now. But the thing is, is that the, the mind, as you're saying, hasn't evolved, and technology has, mm -hmm. and desire has, it seems. Mm -hmm. But our, our, our foundation, however, our minds work don't seem to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, for me, of many years of, different things and to come to, you know, meeting you and, a, and the type of practice, which is, is it's pretty austere. <laughs> it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, archetypes, family <laughs> constellation, you know, but it's, I mean, this is a kind of very personal statement, but it's like, what else do you have left, you know, <laughs> without making it romantic or dramatic to, to, mm -hmm. to try to just Go in like this, and 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 not get get uh, aha. I mean, it's because it's mm -hmm. really can be so fun, or you can get devastated if you have a bad day. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, and it is. Um, but that really requires an incredible commitment. I mean, however people are doing it, and and I'm wondering how the Buddha would feel with all the diversity in the world mm -hmm. and the, you know, the incredible rightness that everybody thinks you know that God is on their side, no matter what side they're on, or the money, it's, it's quite, um, I guess it just becomes very individual, but it's, it, it would just be so lovely if everybody would stop, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that, which probably won't happen, but. Yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> it probably won't happen, <laughs> which is why, you know, we, we have to do what we can do starting with right. ourselves right. and without any attachment to outcomes. Now the one thing I have a question about mm -hmm. that, not to, so, so that, I, I mean, I, 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 I just, I mean, I understand that, I guess, but then in, in bodhisattva vows, where one, if we are meditating for enlightenment, or have taken, at least in the Tibetan tradition, I don't know, we've taken bodhisattva vows to be a bodhisattva, <laughs> and, and to, if you come to a certain level of awareness, and you're, you're, you're wanting to come back. And then I wonder about that, like, gee, would I really, do I, I'm not saying I would even be there, but just being so aware of suffering and pain by the time I reach the end of my life, maybe, I wouldn't want to come back. And isn't the Buddha's teaching to, I mean, is it to reincarnate or to come back and keep helping no matter what? Or Can you address that? Big, big question. <laughs> that is a very, very... I don't know where that came from. Yeah, yeah, that's a very big topic. Yeah. Um, yes. I, it would, it's something that's very well worth talking about. I'm not sure if Probably this not is, tonight. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not, I don't think tonight is the right time, but let me just see. Um, we, we could certainly talk about it tomorrow night if the, if the interest is there. Mm -hmm. But it is this, if you, on the one hand, practice to achieve your own awakening, which is also your own liberation from suffering, the important thing to remember is that the only way that that comes about is if you attain wisdom. Mm -hmm. And true wisdom, it seems, and you, uh, if you'd say uh, true wisdom seems to uh, necessarily involve compassion. Mm -hmm. And 
if, if you don't know why I say that, I think you do know why I say that, but uh, wherever we see true wisdom, and all we have to do is look at the Buddha, and, you know, as, as, as Tim brought up the other day, and there's a, you're, why upon achieving his own enlightenment did he spend uh, another 45 years teaching other people? This is this is a total expression of compassion, and anywhere that we want to look, we say, find over and over again where somebody possesses what we would uh, uh, regard as true wisdom. We find compassion is always there. So then we are selfish beings, and if we can direct our selfishness to becoming awakened then if we succeed, we'll have wisdom. And that wisdom seems to inevitably involve compassion. So looking at it that way, we can expect to be compassionate when we're enlightened. Right? If we're not enlightened, then we would still be burdened by the suffering, and we might have a thought like, you know, well, I wouldn't want to come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the thought that I would want to come back or that I wouldn't want to come back, either one of those thoughts is an unenlightened thought. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> because there is no I. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, I won't worry about that anymore then for a while. <laughs> well, we, but you know, it's something that that we we can talk about. Um, I think we're trying to we're, we're trying to have a uh, an understanding of Buddhism, and we can't have an understanding of Buddhism unless we confront some of these questions that come out of all of these other traditions, all of these other Buddhist traditions. Mm -hmm. You know, and the Buddhist tradition, it really takes some work because you have a lot of Buddhist tradition that goes on and on about reincarnation and puts everything in the context of, you know, multiple lives over a long period of time. But then you have the Buddha himself saying over and over again, no self, no self, no self, empty, 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 no self, impermanent, you know. So we have to sort out the confusion of this and the and the role that it plays, mm. and uh, that's worth talking about. Yeah, okay. I think you. I think in order. I mean, you could practice Buddhism, and you can be successful and become awakened. But I think it, it's very helpful to also think through some of these intellectual aspects of uh, of the path.